Uh, we are back from Washington. Let me just say it was cold and rainy, just like you would expect in early May. Uh, we went to, uh, they, I guess, the tulip fields. Those are pretty. Did, how many of you guys knew about the tulip fields in Washington? It was like, they're, they're incredible. We went. It cost, I, I paid for my daughter and son-in-law, and it was like 80 bucks we got in there, and it was so stinking cold and freezing, and that wind was blowing. We're like, oh, those are amazing. Those are wonderful. Let's get out of here. I don't care if I just lost 80 bucks. So, uh, but we actually stood there for a while. We, uh, yeah, I mean, it, those of you that know me, it takes a lot for me to get cold. And uh, let me just say, I was cold. So we came back and it was sunny and then all of a sudden rain hit again, but I guess that's how it is. California, we're very thankful for every bit of rain, aren't we? So we passed Lake Shasta and it was actually full, like the trees were there and then there the water was right there. It was amazing. We haven't seen that in so long. So thank you God for rain. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> we're starting this series today and I title it Incognito. And we're going to be talking about the unnamed heroes of the Bible, uh, people that you don't know their names, uh, but you know the stories. And there's great lessons that we can learn from that. And I've actually wanted to do a series uh, like this for a while because, you know, I've talked about David. We talk about Paul. We've talked about Peter. But what about the unnamed people? And I think how important that is because our culture today, how many of you know everybody wants to be included in everything? Every, you know, we live in a world where everybody wants to be famous. You know, uh, Pastor Colin was telling me about one of the kids that eight years old and wants to be a YouTube star. And it's like, come on, you're eight years old. Why are you even worried about that? You know, we have Hollywood. We got these music icons. Can I say that even in the church, there are ministers of the gospel that they want to be the next superstar preacher. And so they do kind of all kinds of outrageous things in order to get YouTube clicks and likes and people to start following after them. And, and let me just say, I'm not picking on anyone because that is our culture, isn't it? Our culture encourages that. We celebrate it when, you, when you're that kind of a person, you're that celebrity, and you can't blame the world for being the world, can you? Like when they don't know the Lord, that's just how it is. But in the church, it's like we exalt people because of the gifts that God has given them, right? Oh, you're wonderful. You're this. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, that just if, even if you're a, a pastor, that doesn't mean you don't still struggle with ego, right? How many of you know we all have pride and, and it, can, it can put people in an unhealthy place, uh, and it's not that you don't honor people. How many of you know honor is good, but that's different than putting people up on a pedestal. It's different than exalting people. You know, the scripture says uh, in James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he, God, will lift you up. <laughs> I don't think it means that the culture will lift you up. That we're, we're lit. oh man, you're amazing. This person's wonderful. And then all of a sudden we get shocked when we see some of these celebrity pastors fall. And it's like, wait a minute, they were human, right? We put them up at such this high level that they were this superhuman. That's not how it works. And it's a dangerous thing to put people in that place. Jesus said this, whoever wants to be the greatest must be what? A servant, exactly. As a matter of fact, that's kind of, it's not just our culture. Paul actually shunned this. There, in Corinth, they were like people that became followers of Paul. I follow Paul. Others were like, no, no, I follow Apollos. And, and others were like, I follow Peter. So they were already dividing themselves way back then. And Paul's like, this is foolish. We're all nothing. We're just servants of the Lord. One plants, one waters, but God's the one that brings it, makes the growth. And, and we have that tendency to put people up there. So certainly there are heroes in the Bible that we know their name. We know about Paul, obviously Peter, even Apollos, King David. I mean, he's a, a, a superhero of the Bible. Daniel, who doesn't know about Daniel in the lion's den? Uh, Abraham, Moses separating the water. There's so many, Ruth, Deborah, there's women and heroes in there too. Uh, but I believe that God purposely didn't name everybody in every hero in the Bible for a reason. I believe that God wanted just the average person to know that even if nobody ever knows your name, 
even if you never get any kind of recognition for the things that you do for God or for other people, maybe you'll never get a promotion. You'll never even get a pat on the back. I want you to know that God sees you. God sees what's going on. And I believe that we serve a God that takes every talent, every act of service that you and I do for him or for somebody else, and he uses those things to create lasting impact in other people's lives. Amen? How many of you know the things God uses in us is going to last a whole lot longer than a like on YouTube? Amen? Isn't that a better reward? So I'm going to give you guys a very uh, common story that, that if you've been serving the Lord for any amount of time, you've heard it. Uh, but I want to walk you through the story and, and kind of think about it in a different way. And then I'm going to pull a few lessons out of it that we can learn. So it starts in Mark chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 1. Uh, it says, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, so he'd been in there before, it says, the people heard that he had come, so many gathered that were there, uh, so many people gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, he preached the word of God to them. So he's in a home, and it's a huge crowd that is there. Why was this crowd there? Because the last time he was in Capernaum, there were miracles that took place. He cast a demon out of somebody that everybody knew. Stay away from the crazy guy, right? Uh, a woman was instantly healed of a fever. And when people heard about those miracles that first time, uh, more people came. Like when you hear about miracles, how many of you know it attracts other people? So now Jesus is back, and now the crowd is unmanageable. Now people can't, you know, they're looking through every window. Uh, they're crowded who knows how far out in the street, hoping to hear or even catch a little bit of a glimpse of Jesus. So it was packed. Everybody was there. And then we see in verse 3, some men came bringing them a paralytic carried by four of them. So four guys heard that Jesus was back. He's coming into town, and they're like, hey, you know what? Let's get our friend, and, you know, I, I named him Matt in the first service because, you know, he was just laying there. <laughs> like, I know, that's bad, isn't it? Uh, so they're like, hey, let's go get our friend Matt, and let's pick him up, and let's carry him there, right? And so they did. They picked him up. They took him to Jesus, and, and here's the thing. We don't know these four guys' names. We don't know uh, their relationship to the guy, the paralytic. We don't know the paralytic's name. We don't know any of that. But we do know this. He had no way of getting to Jesus by himself. He couldn't do that. So you've got to understand. I want to give you a little history of the first century mindset. Some of you are aware of it, but the Jewish people believed that if you suffered some kind of a handicap or some kind of a sickness, it was because of sin that you did or your parents did. That was basically, I mean, what a bad way to look at God. Oh, yeah, God's paying you back. That's why you got that limp. What'd you do? Uh, that's not how it worked. But they thought, it, like, if you're blind, you must have sinned. If you had leprosy, I mean, that's even worse. So you, like, really sinned. But this is their belief on those that were paralyzed. <clears throat> they said, oh, it's because of some immoral lifestyle, some kind of sexually transmitted disease. That's why you're in that position. So instead of helping people that may be in that situation, what they did was avoid those people. Like, let me go all the way a guy. But I love this guy, this paralyzed man. He had some real friends. Amen. Aren't you glad to have real friends? We need, we need not the fair weather friends that when the money runs out, they're out. We need people that are around us that are there through the thick and thin. Amen. That's the important thing about being a part of the church is that we develop real friends, amen? And so they came to their friend. They're like, hey, listen, Jesus is in town. Uh, we got this, Matt. We're going to pick you up. We're going to take you there to meet Jesus. But guess what? We expect you to walk back on your own. They had that complete expectation. So they pick him up. When they got to the house, obviously Jesus was teaching. But the problem, again, is the crowd is everywhere. I'm, I, they went all the way around the house, I can imagine, looking for a window, looking for a door, looking for an opportunity, maybe yelling, hey, listen, we need to get this guy to Jesus. Nobody budged because it really nobody cared about the paralyzed man. And so they stayed there, <coughs> but these guys were on a mission like you wouldn't believe. They were going to get him to Jesus. 
One way or another, they didn't let the crowd stop them. No matter what, they were going to get there. And so they started looking around. Let's figure this out. One guy had a plan. Let me tell you about the houses back then. They had flat roofs. They're not like our roofs today. And, and up on the roof where they had more space, they would treat it more like a patio or a deck that we do today, like socialize. They could eat up there. And, and oftentimes there were ladders that went to the roof. And so one guy says, hey, listen, there's, we're going up. Let's take him up to the top there. And, and, and they carried him up to the top. And I don't know if the other guys all understood this plan, but he approached one part of the roof and he goes, okay, right here, we're going to cut a hole and not just a little hole. We're going to make this hole big enough to lay lower down the whole paralyzed man. So probably like a three by five or six uh, foot hole, depending how tall that guy was. And, uh, and he says, okay, guys, Jesus is down there teaching. So cut quietly so we don't interrupt what's going on. How many of you know odd plan, right? Who would have thought of that plan? But you got to admire the tenacity. You got to admire they were determined to get their friend there. They weren't going to let a crowd. They weren't going to let a packed house. They weren't even going to let a roof stop them from getting there. And that's the kind of faith that they had. They had the kind of faith that, hey, listen, uh, we're going to do whatever it takes to get our friend there. And that was risky. It's risky. How many of you just say it's risky cutting into people's roofs, <laughs> right? I don't know what the law was back then, but I'm pretty sure it was against the law just to go around and cut holes in people's roofs, right? So they could have gotten arrested in that, but their determination combined with their love for their friend, it made them push forward. And I can imagine the scene. I imagine sometimes just imagine yourself. You're in there. You're listening to Jesus. Oh, man, this is so good. This is so amazing. And then all of a sudden they started hearing a cutting sound. And you're like, wait a minute, what's going on, right? They tried to ignore it at first, and all of a sudden, dust and debris started falling down on their heads. Like, what? what is going on here? And maybe, I don't know, did a point happen where there was a small hole, and they saw like an eyeball looking through, like, is this the right place? Is Jesus there? And all of a sudden, the hole's getting bit. I'm sure people were a little bit annoyed. Like, I'm trying to listen to Jesus here. Can you show Shut that racket up. What's going on? And maybe they, and the owner of the house had to be the most irritated. Obviously, it's his house. But not just that. It's like, I finally got Jesus into my house, and he's teaching, and these four knuckleheads are up there messing this whole thing up. What is going on? Uh, it's like, it won't stop. They just keep cutting. They just keep cutting. What in the world is going to go on? Uh, and then, eventually, the hole came, it was opened up. I'm, I'm assuming that they pulled the debris up instead of just letting it fall, but we don't know. The scripture doesn't say how that happened, but it was finally big enough, and they tied a rope onto all corners of the cot, and they began to lower their friend right down, right in front of Jesus. And, and you know, I wish this story had more details, don't you, sometimes? Like, what was going on? Wonder what was said. What did the guys say when they're like, you know, looking down like, hey, man, sorry about your roof. <laughs> you know, it was looking pretty bad anyway. So my friends and I, we're, we're helping you out. You needed to get some work done here. Or, or, or I, hey, listen, sorry about your hole, but our friend really needs to see Jesus. Uh, we don't know. We don't know, what, we don't know what the paralyzed man thought. As he's being lowered down there like, oh, no, this was the craziest plan <laughs> my friends have ever had. And uh, my, maybe saying, hey, guys, I, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry about my friends, but obviously I couldn't stop them. They're going to do what they're going to do. I don't know. I, I think about these things sometimes. And uh, think about this man. He just got lowered. His friends cut a hole. They didn't have permission to do that. And this guy, the paralyzed man, uh, wasn't invited and really wasn't even wanted there by most of the crowd. People started staring, you know, oh, that's the guy with the sexual sin, you know, he's gross. Let's avoid him because for years people avoided him. But check out this scene. All of a sudden they can't avoid him now. He's right there, right in front of them. And, uh, and, and so he's there and Jesus looked up at the guy. He didn't, he didn't mind being interrupted. 
He didn't mind that. He didn't correct the guys for cutting the hole. But Jesus' first words really wasn't what they were expecting. Nobody expected it. Because remember, they brought their friend for a reason. Why did they bring their friend? To be healed, healed, right? That was the goal. That was the the whole purpose of cutting holes and all of that stuff. In verse 5, Jesus, first of all, he looks up and it says that he saw their faith. Whose faith? The four friends, right? Everybody else saw a hole. Jesus saw faith. Amen? Amen. They saw a problem. They saw a guy that just interrupted this amazing teaching with Jesus. But Jesus, and, and, and he doesn't even say the paralyzed man. We don't know if this guy, Jesus knew why he was here. And Jesus always had priorities in order, doesn't he? His always, the, the most important thing, it was a matter of the statement by saying that. When he, this is the first recorded time <coughs> in Scripture where Jesus is forgiving sin. And his statement is saying, basically, I'm not just a man here doing amazing things by God. He's basically saying, I am God. And when people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, yes, he did numerous times. But this one right here, Jesus knows that only God can forgive sin. And so he's making this bold statement. And and he's saying it on purpose because look what happens in verse 6. It says, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God alone? Well, that is true, right? Only God can do it. And so they didn't say it out loud as they were just thinking to themselves. They're just, it's like going on, but we know that Jesus knew what they were thinking. And, And let me just say, Jesus was not reading their mind. He's not a mind reader. That's not how Jesus operated. Some people have said, well, maybe, God, maybe the word of knowledge was being used, and that's a possibility. The Holy Spirit could have told him that. Uh, or it was just simply that Jesus, knowing how controversial that statement was, and he knew the crowd that was there ready to pick him apart with everything that he said, he already knew. He already knew he had a judgmental crowd there with the Pharisees. And he's going to throw out there, I forgive your sin. He knew what they were going to think. It doesn't take much. How many of you know, sometimes you don't need, you know, a word of knowledge to see what somebody's thinking, especially if you're married to them, right? (laughs) Like sometimes my wife's like, yeah, I know what you're thinking. I'm like, why? I tried to pull the mannequin face on it and it didn't work, right? Anybody ever try that? You you know, your, your spouse can read you, but you can read other people's face. And I'm sure when Jesus said your sins are forgiven, I'm sure the, the Pharisees' faces were contorting at that thought. I can't believe, you know, they're not saying it out loud, but Jesus knew what they were thinking. Yeah, you have no idea what you are saying. He understood what was going on. He knew what they were thinking. And, uh, and I love what it says. He says this, why are you thinking these things? And they're probably thinking, we didn't think that. <laughs> yes, you did. He knows what he was thinking. So I love what it says. He goes, what is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are to get up, take up your mat, and walk. Now, he wasn't really asking. That was a rhetorical question, wasn't it? Because I actually counted. There's only four words, and your sins are forgiven. There's seven words, and get up and take up your mat and walk. So the easiest one to say is your sins are forgiven. But that's not why Jesus did that. How can I communicate this with a few words possible? That's not what he was talking about. He's telling them something that the Pharisees couldn't do either. All right? They couldn't forgive sin, and they couldn't heal anybody either. They had no ability to do that. But how many of you know God can forgive sin, and God can bring miraculous healing? And so verse 12, the man got up took his mat, walked out in full view of everybody. And, and that's kind of it. We don't get to this spectacular uh, display of physical healing like, like many of us would, right? I mean, the, the, they completely missed the more significant thing of a forgiven heart. They completely missed it. And let me just say this, that in today's world, actually, I would say probably ever since then, we do the exact same thing. Crowds are drawn to things that are spectacular, we want to go see the amazing things. But people being saved of their sins, forgetting, well, we're used to that. Yeah, that's just, that just happens in church. Oh, yeah, praise God. Somebody raised their hand, gave their life to the Lord. Uh, hallelujah. We'll see you next week. All right? Isn't that true? See, we chase the things that we can see, but we ignore the things that are unseen. 
of a heart being transformed and changed to be more like him. And, and, and let me just say, if we had somebody that was paralyzed and all of a sudden they stood up and started walking, how many of you know this place would go nuts? Isn't that true? We'd be like, whoa, that was awesome. Like nobody would be trying to get out of church early to make it to Applebee's first. They're like, hey, listen, I've got a prayer. I'm next in line, right? I need prayer too. If you can heal that, then you can heal the thing that's going on in my. There would be posts on Facebook and Instagram and uh, all of that like, hey, check out. And then next week, how many of you know, we would find everybody that we can like, hey, listen, you got to come because you're going to get healed right? It, it would be a whole different thing. And then you'd be going out, man, that was a great service. We need to have more of that right there. Isn't that true? But if, forgive, if somebody's forgiven, I mean, listen, like I said, some people, they're, they're so concerned. And I'm not going to say here, but you've been to churches where all of a sudden they're like, hey, let's bow our heads. If you've not received Christ and you already got people moving for the exit, you already got people like, how are we going to get out of here before the traffic gets too crazy and the lines at the restaurants get too hard? Listen, I, I just want to say, I, I believe that we miss it sometimes because we undervalue. We just see it as common. And, and I've heard people every now and then people come and tell me, why don't we see miracles like we did, you know, like, like God used to do back then? Why isn't God, I mean, like, like our Christ-like guys, do you know how many addicts have come in and changed their life around? right? And, and never go back. Listen, God is doing big, amazing things. What bigger miracle is there than a heart that has changed for eternity? Amen. That's the biggest one. So I want to encourage you, never forget that a forgiven heart, that's the greatest miracle right there. That's the greatest miracle. People getting out of wheelchairs, blind eyes open, cancer heal, those are amazing and they'll fill arenas, right? But I want to tell you that a forgiven heart will fill heaven. Amen. Amen. See, you, I've, I've seen people that have had amazing miracles happen in their life, and, and they turned away from God. Right? So you can have all the miracles, and we, I believe that God still does miracles. I, we've seen them. But I want to tell you, I want my priority to be right. I want to fill heaven first. Amen. I want people to, to know him. Here's the thing that, that we forget sometimes. Forgiveness is not a bonus. That is our greatest need. That's our greatest need. And so, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I'm just going to give an opportunity right now. I know it's the middle of the service, but can I just have everybody just kind of bow your head? I want you to kind of search your soul right now and say, you know what? If this were my last day on earth, would I make it into heaven? And if not... I want to take a time in the midst of this service and let's pray right now. If you say, Pastor, I want to make a fresh start with him. I want to make a fresh commitment, whether it's new or a restart. How many of you know God is good at restarts? Amen. Amen. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I want to pray. I want to make a restart. Amen. Amen. God is good at that. I see about four hands. So uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Can we pray this together? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you that you still love me. Thank you that you are the prodigal son's father waiting. And I surrender my life to you anew today. I'm making a fresh start. I give my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Four people. What would have happened if four people stood up that were paralyzed and started walking? How would we have responded? <laughs> yeah. Just want you to think about that. We need to celebrate the right things. I mean, we, listen, if somebody's paralyzed gets up and walk, I'm celebrating that too. But I'm also celebrating fresh starts because that's powerful. Amen. That's not just going through the motions. That not, that's not just like, oh, okay, listen. That's what's going to matter for eternity, isn't it? So the second thing I noticed, first one, we celebrate the wrong things sometimes or, or undervalue it. Number two, uh, these four friends, they didn't receive any reward. No reward. Not, they didn't get anything special. Listen, they didn't even get their name in the Bible. Come on, God, couldn't I get a little bit right there? These guys will forever be known as the man that carried the mat and destroyed somebody's roof. That's who they are. That's all we know them by. 
But, but let me just say this. In church, if I announce that everybody that is willing to serve in our nursery uh, will get a new car, I want you to think about it. Uh, see, Daniel's hands up. He's, I'm ready to go, right? I'm just going to tell you, if we could offer that, uh, I would like, Pat, can, can you come up and preach again? Because I'm going for my new car, right? I'm going to go serve in the nursery. He might, he might beat me back there, right? How many of you know we would have plenty of people that would be willing to do that? Or our preschool class that is yet to be started. How many of you know we need a preschool class here? Our nursery is getting full, and, and we desperately need that. So if I said, hey, listen, we're going to start a preschool class. I need some teachers that will rotate in there. And if you do that, I will pay your gas for the next year in California. Any, any volunteers, right? I'm not actually doing that, but uh, uh, how many of you know we, we would, it would be no problem getting that class started? Or how about this one right here? Hey, listen, if you will actually, not just invite, but if you will actually bring 10 people with you to church, then we're going to give you a brand new home. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? It's like, you're going you're gonna, to, hey, listen, guy, I'll give you $1,000 if you come to church with me, right? You'd be bribing people like, okay, that's $10,000 for a new home. I can do it. I can find that many people that we would do whatever it takes to get 10 people. We'd have like 15 services going on. People that happen to go through our, on, see us online and you're like five states away, you'd be like, hey, uh, you know what? Let's get 10 people. We're making a trip to uh, uh, Cameron Park, California. I almost said Colorado for some reason. <laughs> I'm going way back in my history there. So listen, if we did that, or let me just say this. If I said that, hey, listen, we need more people that will serve as greeters, hospitality team. If you'll do that, we will give you a new iPhone or iPad of your choice. All right? I mean, we'd have a line. We'd have 20 people out there greeting you whenever you're walking in. We may have 100 people out there. I don't know. So, uh, but maybe the lesson that we get about getting the blessing or the recognition for what you do as much as it is being able to be a blessing in somebody else's life. Amen. Can I, can I be a part of the miracle in somebody's life? Listen, most of the ministries that we do around here, it doesn't come with a paycheck. Right? We can't. As a matter of fact, we're going to ask you to give your money to make it possible to do the ministry that you do. You're like, wow, that's not right. Here's the thing. You're not, you may not get an earthly reward, but can I tell you what you will get? You'll get the knowledge of knowing that people came to Jesus because of your service. You know, Easter Sunday came, and every church, you know, they have high, high attendance. Do you realize that we had almost 200 people here for Easter? I mean, that's crazy. Between both services, it's like, well, you know what made that possible? Is that there were people that were singing, and guys that were disciples in Jesus, uh, people that helped put together the tomb, uh, people that were serving in our nursery, our kids' ministry, people that were putting eggs out there for the kids that were greeting, people that were working back there in the sound, and, you know, they were all doing double duty back there with lights and camera and all of that stuff. Uh, that was possible because of all of that all these different people and it's like well i didn't really have anything to do with it yes you do every little thing that you do to serve god serve others god keeps record of and you have a part in people coming to the lord you have a part in what happened and the reality is that eternal destinations are changed because of what you do Pastor Colleen was talking about the missions giving. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll give a little bit of money to mission. That money that you give goes to that missionary who in turn is able to preach the gospel and reach people there. And it's like, sometimes you don't think about it, but being a part of somebody else's miracle, can I tell you, that's the greatest gift in the world. And if you've never experienced being part of it, I would say find a place to serve because it is powerful. It is, there is nothing better. I, I believe you are more blessed. You know, Jesus said this, it is more blessed to do what? Give than? I know, but, and, and we know that, but if you don't ever experience that, if you've never been a part of somebody else's miracle, then, then, then you don't really understand how much that is true. And so God, that's what we can learn from them. They weren't looking for themselves. They weren't digging the roof hole for themselves. They wanted to be a part of their friend's miracle. 
They didn't care if their name was mentioned. They didn't care. I'm sure they were like, you know what? We'll go to jail for a few days, pay the fine, whatever it is for tearing up this guy's roof, as long as our friend gets healed. It was worth it to them. So that was number two. Number three, I, I feel like we just need to be more passionate, more creative, more determined about bringing people to Jesus. We've got to be more. These, these guys, they risk their time, their energy, their status in the community. I mean, think about it. They could have been really ridiculed. Like if they had done all of that, lowered their friend down, and Jesus got mad at them, how many of you know that wouldn't have worked out so well? Like, like people would have been making fun. Oh, yeah, you remember when you guys cut the hole in the roof and Jesus got mad at you? They would have just been messing with them, right? Or if their friend hadn't been healed, again, they'd have just been ridiculed. What were you guys thinking? What were you thinking, right? These guys, they did a lot. I mean, they saw the crowd. Uh, they could have looked at the crowd and said, this is too much. I'm sorry, we can't get in today. We're going to have to try another time. We'll see what Jesus is doing. And, and probably nobody would have blamed them. It would have been like, yeah, you're right. It was pretty crazy. If they had given up, guess what? Their friend wouldn't have got the miracle. If they would have given up, he would have missed that opportunity, not just to walk again, but to have that forgiven heart, which is more important. Amen. I feel like we need to have that same kind of whatever it takes, nothing's going to stop me attitude. We got to get that determination. We can't give up sharing our faith just because somebody didn't respond well. Amen? Well, they kind of made fun of me, so I guess I won't ever say anything ever again. No, we got to like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to try it again. Maybe you've invited somebody to church and they're like, ah, nah, I'm not going to make it. But can I tell you, keep inviting. Keep inviting. If it didn't work one way, try another. We got to figure out how to uh, 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 get people here. I mean, if we, we got two services. We have a gal that, that uh, those of you that were here last month on uh, St. Patrick's Day, we had Reuben sandwiches. How many of you guys remember that? They were really good. We had one gal who bought seven sandwiches. Her family, the key is you got to come to church to get them. And you know what? Guess who was here that day? All seven of her family members were here in order to get the sandwich. I thought, man, that's pretty creative. What are you going to do? What can I do to get somebody here? Invite them out to somewhere nice to eat. Hey, listen, if you come, I'm buying your lunch. I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit there. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that you can get people. Maybe they won't come initially to a church service, but we talked about this earlier, the women's tea that's coming up. How many of you know that's an opportunity sometimes just to get somebody in the door? Because there is a boundary that some people have. If they've never been in a church or it's been a long time, the enemy's really good at throwing guilt on people, is he not? Oh, man, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go there. And, and then I'm going to... And it's like, hey, listen, why don't you come to a tea? It's going to be a great time. You get... And it's like, oh, somebody might come to that, right? Or the men's conference that we talked about. Hey, listen, I'm not inviting you to church, but I want you to come to this men's event. It's going to be awesome. And you get them there and they encounter Jesus. Or listen, this is something that happens every week at our church is our life groups. Amen. If you're not a part of that, listen, the purpose of the life group, yes, it's to go deeper in the word. We go over some of the questions that are in the bulletin. But how many of you know the main purpose is to get people connected to other people? Right? We live in a world where people are very lonely. And you start getting them connected. And here's the thing about the life group. Do you realize you can bring your unchurched friend to a life group? Uh-oh. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I, John, your friend is here, right? So uh, uh, you can bring your uh, unchurched friend. And, and they're like, they may not come to church, but hey, listen, come over to my friend's house. We got a group of us. We're going to have a meal together, and, and it's going to be a great time. So listen, we got, we got life groups up and down this, uh, uh, what do you call this, the I-50 I <laughs> corridor. Thank you like that. All the way from Pollock Pines to... Uh, Thank you. Man, what is, I must have been on vacation or something last week. My mind is not working. Uh, but this is such a great way. How many of you know a life group is a way to get people to Jesus? Well, I'm trying to get them to church. Well, invite them to this life group. Your neighbors, your friends. And I, here, here's the thing. Here's the formula that I'm trying to get out there. Your effort 
plus Jesus' power begins somebody else's miracle. How many of you know your effort by itself is not going to do it? If you try to do it yourself, it won't work. Uh, but your effort, your passion, your determination, your, your praying for somebody always results and connects with the power of Christ, and you begin to see life transformation. Amen? Does anybody uh, have somebody in your life that you want them to know Jesus? You want them to meet Jesus? Uh, let me tell you, begin to pray. God, help me to be creative. Help me to show. Give, buy him a book or something. Find something. You know, ask God, God, how can I reach my friend? How can I reach my family member? I believe there is no greater joy than seeing the life of someone you love changed by the power of God. Amen? Can I just ask this question? How many of you today are serving God because somebody else invited you? And let me say, my hand is up. My hand is up because if it wasn't for some of my friends back in high school, I wouldn't be serving God today. All right? They began inviting me. I went to all kinds of crazy churches. I got like an array. I didn't even know there was a difference between the different churches. Uh, and I, start, I got invited to all kinds of different ones. But, but I got invited to the one that I really, God gave, uh, I changed my life. They had this uh, group that would meet uh, you, teenagers. And we had a, they had a big gym. And, and I started coming on a regular basis. And let me tell you, God got a hold of my heart. And you can be that same miracle for somebody else. The last one, number four, the paralyzed man was excluded by the crowd, included by his friends, and welcomed by Jesus. You see, the crowd saw this dirty, rotten, disgusting sinner. They had no mercy for him. The friends saw him differently. They looked beyond where he was to who he could be. How many of you know that's powerful? A lot of times we just see the outward of somebody and we're like, ah, yeah, they're just a mess. And it's like, no, God sees beyond that. And when he got to Jesus, Jesus welcomed him, he included him, he forgave him, and he healed him. So my question for you today in this story, who are you like? I mean, I don't want to be like the crowd. Anybody else? No, I don't want to be the crowd. I want to be like those friends that, that included him. Can I say this? Don't ever exclude someone Jesus is ready to welcome. Don't ever exclude. Who is Jesus ready to welcome? Everyone, Everyone right? Yeah, everyone. That guy's a jerk, right? I don't want to talk to him. You know, he deserves what he gets. So maybe a boss. Anybody have a, a boss that, that rubs you like sandpaper, right? Maybe the kid down the street. Maybe the addict that has been struggling their whole life and it's like, ah, oh, they deserve it. You know what? They made their own bed. Now they need to lie in it. Maybe it's an old person that you know that's always grumpy, but guess what? You don't know the pain that they're going through. You don't know what's going on. Maybe it's a teen dressed with tattoos and piercings all over. How many of you have seen that before? And you're like, man, what is wrong with that person? Maybe they just need the love of Jesus. All right? Maybe they just need that. Maybe it's their person today, especially young people struggling with gender identity because our culture has swayed them in that direction right? And we're like, oh, I can't believe that. Maybe they just need someone to show them Jesus. Amen? Have we marginalized groups? This is my challenge to think about it. Have, have we labeled some people unworthy when you really don't even know anything about their life, their hurts, their sufferings, their pain? Have we put them in that category? I want to ask you, ask yourself, who have I excluded that Jesus is ready to welcome? If someone comes to mind, what do I do? I need to repent. I need to ask God, God, give me, give me your eyes to see this person. Help me to see them like you do. Do, do whatever you can. Here's the thing, and I really feel impressed. We, we can't get this wrong, church. We can't mess this up. God forgive us when we're angry at sinners for doing exactly what sinners do is sin. Right? Oh, I can't believe they did that. Well, you know what? They wouldn't be a good sinner if they didn't sin. Isn't that true? I know. Like, like Hello? Help us as Freedom Church to be the ones that bring sinners to Jesus. Amen? Because every one of us were in that place, and somebody brought us to him. How many of you know, and I put it in your bulletin just so that you have it, our vision statement at Freedom Church is to bring people that are far from God, close to God, as we love Jesus and others faithfully. It's really that simple. That's what, well, that's what God has called us to do. Let me just say, we can't get tired. We've got to be passionate. 
We've got to be determined. We've got to get creative to help bring people to Jesus. Because let me just say this, nothing in this life matters more. Amen? What matters more than bringing somebody to Jesus? All the things that we get worried about and worked up about on this side. You know, one day we leave this earth, and the only thing that's going to matter is who you brought to Jesus. Not going to matter if you got a bigger house. Not going to matter if you ever got your healing on this side of heaven. It's not going to matter all the things that we get worked up about. So-and-so said this about me. I'm just so mad at him. It's not going to matter who cut you off in traffic. Right? It's not going to matter who's president, who will be president, who brings this country down or lifts it up, or all of those things that we get so worked up about. The only thing that matters is who do we bring to Jesus. And I desperately want to be like one of those four guys. And God, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll cut through somebody's roof, so watch out. I know where you live. What do we need to do to get people to Jesus? What matters more in my life? Getting that next vacation, getting my good retirement. Not that any of those things are bad. We took a nice vacation. We were glad. But I want to tell you, nothing matters more. So as I was thinking about this, we're going to sing a song here. But I wanted to pray first. And uh, just this morning, the, the Lord put this verse on my heart. Like when the disciples, when they were in, uh, after Jesus rose and uh, they healed the, the man going to the temple. And then the, the disciples, they got flogged for it. They're like, they were, they were told, don't ever preach in this name of this man anymore. Don't ever talk about Jesus anymore. And, and they're like, well, who are we going to obey? You or God? So obviously, but then they went back to the group of believers and they began to pray. They were thanking God for suffering. And, and can I just say this? I don't think being a Christian in our world today is going to get any easier. It's not going to get easier. It's becoming, I don't know if you realize this, our world is becoming more and more anti-Christ. Right? Against Christ. That's what that means. Which means that it's paving the way more and more for the actual anti-Christ to come. Right? This is all biblical. This is all prophecy. So we've got to, we've got to firm up. Right? We've got to let our roots grow down a little bit deeper. And instead of just saying, oh, God, help me just to live a life of peace and nobody ever bother me. That's not what we pray. What did the disciples, when, they're, when they were told that, the church gathered around and they said, oh, now, and this is a, a Acts chapter 4, verse 20 now, 29. It says, and now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And it says, after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached the word of God with boldness. How many of you know, I believe that's what the church needs today. We don't need to find a place to hide. So let me just serve God and just get there myself. Uh, and I've shared this before. Our goal in life is not just to arrive safely to death, is it? Let me just make it there. Lord, let me have a good retirement and to pass away in my sleep. No, our, I, I want to die serving God. And whatever it takes, if I can bring somebody to Christ, how many of you know that's worth more than a new car? That's worth more than a free house. Not that those are bad, but I want to tell you, eternally, what matters more is getting people to Jesus. Amen? 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 So can I have everybody stand? And uh, we have a song here. Uh, I'm going to let Pastor Timothy sing it. Uh, don't just listen to it, but, but, but do listen to it, the words. And if it's a reflection of your heart, if it's something that you're feeling in your heart, I just want to encourage you just to, to sing it out as a prayer to him. Amen? How many of you know you can do that with songs? Sing it out as a prayer to him. God, I want you to use me. All right, I'm going to step aside for a minute. If 
Pits bent, chain the bro, wash and filth the feet. Here I am, send me if it's love. The truth cuts like a nail. I will say it anyway. Cause here I am, Lord. Send me if it means that they reject. Lord, your Holy Spirit, fill each and every one of us 
Lord, your word said the house shook and you filled everyone, Lord God. Lord, we're not looking to escape. We're not looking to hide. We're not looking, running for cover, Lord God. We are your church. We are the church that you established. And you said not even the gates of hell would prevail against us, O God. And so, Father, I just declare over each one that is here, Lord, those that are watching online, Lord, I declare your boldness on the Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would take this word, this gospel, and Lord God, we would do, we would be like those four friends. And Lord, do whatever we can to get people to Jesus, get people to you. Lord, that's what you've commissioned us to do. That's what the Great Commission is, to go into all the world. Lord, you want us to bring people to you. Lord, help us to be creative. Help us to go out of our way. Help us to realize that nothing else in this matters. Life matters more than that. And so, Lord God, we commit ourselves to a, uh, that even before you ask, Lord God, we say yes. If you say yes, just say it out loud. Yes, Lord, send me. Send me, oh God. And Father, I thank you for equipping us, even though we're not prepared, even though we can't do it on our own. Lord, that, that, that formula, it's our effort with your power. Lord, we can see lives changed for eternity. Let us not forget that. Let us realize we have the greatest <coughs> power available through your Holy Spirit. And so, Father, I just, I just declare that over this body, Lord God, over anyone that begins to hear this, Lord, that they would go out in boldness into their neighborhood, the highways, the byways, their families, Lord, their co-workers, whoever it is, and declare this wonderful gospel. And Lord, we love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? He is worthy. Amen. Hey, listen, you guys be blessed. If anyone does need prayer, uh, we got a couple of people that will stay up here waiting for you. Uh, otherwise, you guys go out and carry the light. <laughs>